Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Thursday, March 16th, 2017 edition of VR News. I want to start with one of my favorite virtual reality games of all time, easily in my top three, Raw Data from Servios. Raw Data, since its launch for the HTC Vive, has been just extremely polished. Now, it is probably the one game, if you were trying to defend early access and come up with success stories for early access, this would be the game you reach for. Since that first week, the devs have added weapons, classes, missions, enemies, skills. In short, compared to launch week, the game is just so much beefier and just still as fun and rewarding to play as it was back then. So if you haven't hopped aboard the raw data train, especially if you're an Oculus Rift user, I'm telling you, the level of polish on this game, it's going to make you thankful you did buy it. It's that good. And uh, the patch that they released today, like I said, they've added so much, no exception. This one is a very Oculus-centric patch, though. So you are going to get touch control if you're an Oculus user. And let me tell you, with three sensors, it is easily as good as the HTC Vive version for room scale. If you've got two, there is a fair bit of collusion, but... The way they've countered that, there's a neon arrow that appears while you're playing to reorientate yourself. Bloody brilliant. And, and why I say that is it doesn't obstruct your view. Now, there's a few VR games that do similar, you know, when you lose orientation on a 180 game to turn you around and they obstruct the damn field of view and it's, it's annoying. Not the case here with raw data. So if you've been on the fence, you've been eyeing this game, grab it. Believe me. It uh, won't be a game you regret purchasing. Unless, of course, you completely despise wave-based games. I can't help you on that one. All right. Let's talk about the NVIDIA GTX 1080 Ti. Talked about this a week ago, just on the eve of its launch. We have a bunch of benchmarks now. Literally, literally a metric crap ton of benchmarks which highlight the performance difference between the TI and the Founders Edition, like what I have in this uh, gaming beast of mine here. Although not quite as beastly after looking at these benchmarks. Digital Foundry has a fantastic set of videos. I urge you guys, take a look at that. I will include the link below. But essentially, in a nutshell, if you're entertaining the move, okay, if you had a 980 GTX, my advice back then was not to make the jump to the Founders Edition. Hold off. If you were coming from a 970, make the jump. This is why. The TI is why you waited. Because it has approximately a 35% performance jump over the Founders Edition. So coupled with the difference between the 980 and the 1080, you're going to have a reason to upgrade. Price is decent. In fact, it almost renders the Titan X obsolete. And yet, the Titan X is still a few hundred dollars more expensive. But you look at benchmarks, and they are neck and neck. There's an odd benchmark here or there that the Titan X wins. The odd benchmark that the TI wins. But essentially, neck and neck for a lower cost. So I'm going to uh, put a benchmark here. I just want you to take a look at some games. It's kind of uh, two bits of research I threw into the same story. There was also a story on the Core i7. So taking the 5930 Core i7 with the 1080 Ti against a Ryzen 7 1700 OC and comparing the benchmarks. Now, in almost every single case, the i7 clobbers the Ryzen. Now, there's still room for optimization on this. I mentioned that before when I talked about the Ryzen. It could be a completely different picture come summer. But as things stand right now, here, midway through March, 
you're going to want to go with an i7 if you want to eke out as much as you can from that uh, 1080 Ti. Now, there's also the question of 1080 versus 4K. The benchmark that I ha have up shows you the 1080p, and that's why you want to go with the i7 rather than the Ryzen. At 4K, that may look quite a bit different. So that's another question you got to ask yourself. Are you going to primarily be doing 4K or is it 1080p plus VR and that's it? If it is, I'd stick with the uh, i7. If you got a 980 uh, GTX, just to recap, yes, now I would upgrade. All right, next story, Hollywood's biggest directors and what they think of virtual reality. I'm just going to fly through a few of these. Uh, they're mildly entertaining, but in the grand scheme of things, they don't amount to anything important, really. Nothing that uh, you or I who are into VR are going to lose sleep over. Uh, but it's interesting because there are a couple of directors that I would have thought differently. Now, the big one, John Favreau, of course, we know he's all in with his uh, Gnomes and Goblins VR experience, which I still think was one of the most fantastic under 10 minute demos out there for VR. It was just really, really well done. Uh, and if you haven't checked it out yet, it's free. Go do it. But uh, yeah, some others like J.J. Abrams, he's excited, but he's cautious. Uh, Russo brothers are looking into possibilities of using VR with an upcoming Marvel project. James Cameron, he of Titanic and uh, Avatar, not a fan. Can't stand virtual reality. And his exact quote was, he would not consider anything made in VR a film which is pretty uh, strong damnation, right? Uh, from a guy who's usually a bit of a visionary with his deep sea dives and everything else, you know, embraces technology. I don't understand the hate on that he has for it, but you know what? I'm sure he's got some reason for it. Just don't get it. Uh, Justin Lin loves it. And uh, Steven Spielberg working on a VR movie, family oriented VR film. So there you have it, just a few. The link goes into the entire list if you care that much more. <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, YouTube and the quality of its 360 degree videos. So this is something they said they need to address. It is highly technical, so I'm not gonna tear it apart 10 ways to Tuesday. Let's just kind of look at it, you know, in, a, in the summary sense, basically what they want to change is their rendering techniques. So the techniques that they employ to get those 360 degree videos to play on your screen. And they talk about equi rectangular projection. Basically that and cube maps, equi angular <laughs> cube maps as being the key to unlock higher quality for those. So what I will do is just kind of talk uh, about their last summary here at the end of that article where they say the result of all the work with these new technologies is an easily visible improvement in viewer video quality. The image shows screen captures of the left eye for 360 stereo video at 720 displayed in a 1080p Google Cardboard viewer. So the bigger image is for the context of the scene, while the smaller callouts are zoomed in regions to make the differences more apparent. So there you have it. That should correspond with the picture I have up here. So good to see continuous improvement for 360. YouTube has done a decent job of getting 360 content up there. So it stands to reason they're going to try to improve it. Next up, as a pet owner of a very aristocratic cat, a black cat named Cairo, who we got from a shelter uh, almost five years ago now. He has this incredible knack of getting in, way, in, in my way when I'm filming VR stuff. And um, I've stepped on his tail once, and the shrieks that came out of that did not sound cat-like 
or human or anything else. It was like a demonic whale. And of course, I felt bad, right? Uh, didn't seriously injure him, but probably startled the crap out of him. And I'm sure he's got a few, you know, nerve endings in that tail as well that didn't fare too well. But he survived. I've also accidentally kicked him lightly, just my foot walking where I've kind of scooped him from his belly and then deposited him, you know, a foot further. No harm come to him. But that's where this story comes in. Using the tracker. So the tracker from HTC and a cute little harness for your uh, kitty cat. You can ensure with the tracker and a little bit of software, you're not going to harm him or hurt him or have anything bad happen, right? So very cool. I like that idea. And uh, Google wants to clarify that the tracker is light and the jacket a comfortable fit. So this is not something that's going to burden your cat. But look, realistically, if you're in a small space, maybe, you know, if this was a studio apartment, for example, you had your cat here, it's kind of hard to avoid, right? I've got the luxury. I can obviously close the door to the man cave and I know he's not in unless he snuck in previously, which he has done. So very cool. Check that out. Uh, link for that if you want to uh, download that and check it out uh, more in depth. All right. The developer for Lone Echo showing some impressive procedural hand posing uh, for virtual reality and the lead programmer at Ready at Dawn, which are the guys behind this. His name is Jake Copenhaver, and he gave a presentation at the Game Developers Conference. They didn't talk about this story at the time about Lone Echo's animation and locomotion system and how it's focused on a first-person perspective. So there's a, a teaser video that's going to be at the link that I provide. You can check that out. And for most of that video, it's showing an astronaut in a zero-g environment. So kind of floating around. And what's unique about zero-g is one of the ways you do locomotion in zero-g is you guide yourself uh, with your hands. And that's what's going on in this demo and what the procedural hand posing is going to allow you to do. So very cool, very flexible. Uh, very complex finger joint optimization as well that comes across in the video, you can see that. So it'll be interesting to see this paired with games or experiences moving forward. Very cool. Next story, Framestore's advice for producers that are considering virtual reality projects. And what I like about this, and it was an interview with Christine Catano. She is the global head of virtual reality at Framestore, the business. At the South by Southwest, she gave a bit of a presentation on exactly that topic, giving advice to Hollywood type producers on VR, just some of the assumptions and unique challenges that they come across. So for example, uh, the timelines. So she remembers a project she was basically given eight weeks to complete. The problem with virtual reality is it's such a new technology for a lot of the crew working on this. This may have been their first time working in 360, in VR, period. It's so one thing to know video editing, straightforward, regular video. It's a whole other ball game doing video editing with 360 degree source content that needs to be stitched together and edited in a much different way. There's a learning curve there. So assigning those traditional durations doesn't make sense. Those have to be logically revised, at least until the industry catches up. The tools are available and the training is in place. Most importantly, what that leads to experience, right? Have the experience there. And she ends it with additional advice. Give yourself time. So it boils down to more time for user testing, feedback and prototyping. And that's all to make sure that the experience that you're designing is powerful and it's doing things the way you want it done. So very cool. There's some more advice in there. Gets into a little bit of the technical in terms of filmmaking. 
So if that's your bag, you can read more of that at the link. All right, guys, that is it for the news for this Thursday. You guys know what day it is tomorrow. I can't freaking wait. It's been a crazy week. And in a few weeks, I'm going to tell you guys all about the last couple of weeks. And it's going to be glorious. <laughs> but right now, I got to keep it under wraps. As always, guys, cheers. <laughs>